so let me do this question. It says, um, as shown, two identical springs, each with a spring constant. Let me give it some label. And we are going to talk about spring force more when we are doing uh, dealing with uh, energy and potential energy. But uh, we the textbook did cover the Hooke's law forces in chapter five. So you can go based on that. As a reminder, Hooke's law says that spring force is given by, uh, as a vector quantity is given by minus spring constant times the displacement. Uh, it's uh, sometimes what we call restoring force. And that's where that minus sign comes from because uh, the direction of the force is opposite to the displacement. So that's enough for us to go on for this question. And it says, um, these springs are supporting a, an object of this much weight. Okay, so it looks like a question is dividing out the question for us. So part A asks, what is the tension in spring A? Okay, um, I think I can try to answer that without using Hooke's law stuff yet. So, um, so I guess this week or the this past week we haven't spent as much time with this. You have seen some examples of it. I think I've used this in some of the questions. Now this week um, is the week when we are properly placing focus and emphasis on this process, which is what we are going to call standard strategy. Or your textbook calls this, uh, I guess, Newton's law problem solving strategy. If you look at the portable TA, it calls it the uh, multi-block strategy, uh, even though you would use a good chunk of it <laughs> when you don't have multiple blocks. So uh, the way we teach it, we lay it out as a four-step process. It doesn't have to be four, but we <laughs> think it is a four is the clearest way to lay it out. The first step is you draw a free body diagram. This step serves as a step where you make sure that you uh, think about the situation clearly and lay out all the information that you have. And some of the information that you lay out need to get clarified, um, more streamlined, and that's what steps two and three are for. In step two, we choose a core, uh, sorry, <laughs> trying to choose between choose and coordinate. We choose coordinate axis. And usually when you are picking coordinate axis, the biggest uh, consideration is if you can identify some direction of acceleration and choose a parallel to acceleration. In this uh, situation, I think uh, our acceleration will be zero. So um, it'll be something different, but it, this is a general strategy. So I'm just laying out the general set of steps. Step number three, we uh, break down forces into components. So we break down force, uh, into components. And I will show that with this question. It looks like I'll have to do that. And steps one through three are really preparations for step number four, which is the step in which we write down Newton's second law equation that says that net force is equal to mass times acceleration. Or if you want to be more clear about the, the direction of causality, you would say um, acceleration is the net force divided by mass. It's the net force that causes acceleration, not the other way around. But I think, uh, um, yeah, let, you know, let me try that. Uh, I'm more used to doing it the first way, just as, so that I avoid dealing with the fractions, but I'm a big boy, I can deal with the fractions. So let me just uh, try writing down this equation instead of <laughs> uh, F equals MA. But I either should be really fine. So that's the standard strategy and that's the set of steps that we'll try to follow in answering this question. So let me make a little bit of room here. So let me do the first step. Um, so first step is we draw a free body diagram. And when we draw a free body diagram, I try to draw simplest possible diagram because the goal of this diagram, it, you know, it's not artistic. It, the goal of this diagram is to illustrate forces clearly so that I can think through it uh, without any distractions. So in terms of representing objects, I usually like to represent it with a dot because a dot is enough. 
uh, later in the semester, um, as we do with rotation, we'll have to represent the extended bodies, but until we get to that point, that is enough. So on that dot, that uh, this object that I'm trying to illustrate forces for, I think through uh, what are the forces on this object? And, um, and both because it's mentioning the weight and because I have a feeling it's an object near the Earth's surface, I'm going to say, oh, there must be gravity on that object. And that's going to be the weight of the object. And at each stage of each step of drawing free body diagram, you should be asking this question constantly. Did I draw all the forces and only the forces that are actually in the situation? And as you are doing that, one of the guide that's useful is the acceleration. Uh, often you will have some intuitive feel for what the, uh, what the direction of acceleration should be. In this setup, my intuitive feel is that my acceleration should be zero because it's just hanging, it's not doing anything else. Now, so as I look, as I consider this acceleration that in my heart, I know it should be, and I look at the forces, I realize, hmm, that doesn't match up because this downward force says I should have downward acceleration and I know that's wrong. And that's where you would uh, take a look at your setup and recognize that you have springs attached to it. So, okay, so those springs must be pulling on it. So you draw forces for those two springs. And this is where I would lean on the text of the question saying that the springs are identical. And these angles, appear identical and everything. So as I'm drawing these spring forces, I would uh, label them identically, both as a tension force for this tension that they will be asking. Um, relying on that um, with uh, how symmetrical it's been set up, that whatever force is in spring A, it's going to be the same magnitude of force in spring B. And uh, let me just draw some auxiliary figures so that I can label things. This angle theta is given to me. And, you know, this is the same angle. All right. And I keep asking myself this question. Did I draw all the forces? Um, it's, it comes down to the question of with all these forces drawn, can I make them add up in a way that they add up to zero net force so that I get zero acceleration? And I can see that I can make it happen vertically, kind of. I got downward and upward forces. And horizontally, the how, based on how symmetric this whole, whole thing is, I'm fairly confident that leftward force will balance out the rightward force. So, so once you are convinced that you have drawn all the forces, and only the forces in the system, then, then you're done with the step number one. And I, I would really encourage people not to be too hasty with the step number one. I think I say this elsewhere in the lecture. The step number one is, it's the really the most important step. It's the step that takes the most creativity, most consideration, most care. Because um, once you do step number one wrong, then uh, it doesn't kind of doesn't matter how well you do in the remainder of the steps. Um, there's a good chance you'll miss it if you did step number one wrong. And once you've done step number one right, the rest are kind of mechanical. Uh, once you get into the groove of how to solve Newton's law problems, you, you can kind of do steps two through four in your sleep. Um, it's the same thing over and over in every question. So step number two, coordinate axis. Um, so we should pick a coordinate axis so that it's a parallel to acceleration, but oops, my acceleration is zero. So in those cases, what I would say is that you do have a complete free choice of axis. You can pick whatever axis you want. Like if I wanted to, I can pick an axis that goes this way. Now, one thing that I would uh, ask people to consider is, uh, look ahead to step number three and look at how many forces you have to decompose. And when you consider that, um, oh, okay, here it's a little bit, well, I guess uh, here my instinct is to choose the regular straight axis. And I guess if you're strictly going by number of forces, with this axis, you are still decomposing two forces, but I would appeal to symmetry again. However, I'm decomposing one of the two forces, 
the exact same thing is going to apply to the other force. So it's uh, as if I'm decomposing only one force. So, so okay, I chose my coordinate axis in a way that will hopefully simplify the next two steps the most. And step number three, I need to decompose the forces into components. So let me do the, um, uh, let me just get rid of this. T and let me just do one of these two vectors, the one on the left. So um, decomposing means to break out the forces into component that's parallel to the x-axis and one that's parallel to the y-axis. And as you're doing this, sometimes you might uh, notice the right triangle that you're drawing. That's really what you're going for. Uh, once you have this right triangle, then you can identify some angle in it that you can relate to the angles you have been given. And here, I'm looking at this angle here. So this angle should be the same angle as that. It's like an alternate angles thing in geometry, I think. <laughs> um, uh, Draw the triangle, make sure you go through the, the practice of identifying the angular quantities in your triangle. Once you have that, then the rest is uh, trigonometry. So you have the hypotenuse of the triangle. That's what I'm labeling as tension, T. And um, for the side that's opposite uh, to the angle, uh, so, you know, you remember so, ta, hua. So, uh, you know, sine, so sine theta, sine of the angle, is the side that's opposite over the hypotenuse. And cosine of the angle is the side that's adjacent over the hypotenuse. So looking at here, um, the side that's opposite over the hypotenuse, that's going to be sine theta. So I can label this side as uh, doing a little bit of algebra in my head. Um, the opposite side should be the sine theta times the hypotenuse tangent. And same thing here with the adjacent side, side that's adjacent to the angle, looking at cosine theta. So uh, it's the cosine theta times the hypotenuse. And uh, once you get used to this decomposing of forces, a little bit of trigonometry, it should, uh, I hope it becomes mechanical almost. So I'm done with the step number three. And uh, I did only one of the sides, but I'm also imagining the same thing. Uh, I'm imagining the same labels for the, the tension that's going to the right in spring B. So I'm done steps one through three. And the hope is that, and this is the entire goal of the standard strategy, which is that by the time you are at this point, you are ready to do step number four, writing down Newton's second law equation just by reading information off of this free body diagram that you've been building, steps one through three. So let me do that. And um, I write this of arrows as a reminder to me that um, that it's, it's a vector equation, which means each uh, axis, x-axis, y-axis, they get equations of their own. So here I'm going to need to write down two equations, one for the x-axis, one for the y-axis. So uh, let me do that. So uh, for the x-axis, so the acceleration is a zero along the x-axis. Um, I guess that won't always be the case, especially if you have uh, something that's accelerating. So I say that acceleration is equal to the net force. Um, so I'm looking at this diagram. I see the x components of the tension. So those are the forces I'm going to write. So I have uh, T sine theta. That's the force going to the right. And I have, I'm have i going to subtract the force going to the left. Minus T sine theta is equal to, oh wait, not is it? So I better have it. So that's the net force. And that divided by... Uh, let me just use the label m is equal to zero. But uh, you know, it's okay. I'm doing something silly because uh, looking at this, you can see that oh, that adds up to zero. So I'm saying zero is equal to zero. Um, all right. So there's <laughs> no information whatsoever in the particular equation. That's fine. I got the second equation that will hopefully give me what I want. The Newton's second law equation for the y direction is going to be the again acceleration. That's zero. Um, it just worked out that way for this question. That's equal to sum of all the forces in the y direction divided by mass. So let's add up all the forces in the y direction. I got two upward forces, upward with the y components of the tension. 
So, oh, let me do a, uh, <laughs> let me go step by step. So the two forces that are awkward, plus t cosine theta, plus another t cosine theta, and I have a downward force of weight, uh, minus w, and uh, the whole thing divided by mass, that's equal to zero. So, oh, I think I can do a little bit of a simplification. So I have this equation here, and um, I guess um, to, uh, pre uh, uh, to preach what I practice. Um, so, so this is a simpler kind of question where if you just uh, jump to the next step, you'll be fine. You won't really get into trouble. But for the sake of a more complicated problem, you will see in the future. Um, you want, before you, so, this end of the standard strategy leaves you in this place where uh, you have a system of equations. It doesn't quite solve the problem for you. And uh, solving the remainder of the question kind of depends on the directions, depends on what you see. Uh, before you do that, what you want to make sure is that you want to make sure you have enough information. Uh, what that means is enough number of equations compared to the unknowns or in the college algebra terms, you want your number of equations and number of unknowns to match. You need exactly as many equations as you have unknowns. So I check, I have really one equation that I plan to use. And I look at huh, how many unknowns do I have? I don't know T, I'm solving for that. And uh, I'm given the weight. Hmm. I don't know mass. But I think staring at this equation for a while, I think if I do multiply the whole thing by mass m, I can get rid of it. Because on the right hand side, it'll cancel. And on the left hand side, it's going to be still zero. So let me do that. So rewriting it that way, I have zero is equal to t cosine theta plus t cosine theta minus weight. So that's the one equation one unknown, I should be able to solve for tension t. So let me do that quickly. So um, uh, let me uh, combine these two terms. That means it's going to be 2 times t cosine theta. Let me uh, move this w over to the other side. And the way to do it properly <laughs> is you're adding both sides with plus w. So when you do that, you get w on the left hand side is equal to the w that I'm adding on the right hand side is canceling the minus w. So I'm left with the t, 2t cosine theta uh, to solve for t in this equation. Uh, I'm, it, so I'm spelling out the algebra steps I'm going through. Uh, but a lot of the times I'll kind of do some of them in my head. So if any algebra steps I skip in the future confuses anyone, do let me know so that I can um, uh, illustrate more of the steps. Um, this time I'm just doing more of it than usual. So, I, so to isolate t by itself, I imagine multiplying left and the right hand side by one over two cosine theta. And there's a way I'm constructing it. I'm basically trying to get rid of these. And I know if I divide it, I'll cancel it out. So on the left hand side, I get w divided by two cosine theta is equal to the right hand side now just by t itself to cosine theta cancel that. So that's the um, answer for tension in spring A. So uh, I'll plug in the numbers uh, for W and um, it divided by two cosine theta. Uh, I know the theta and the number I get should be the answer. And once I have the tension, that gives me a quick way to get the amount that the spring A stretches that goes back to Hooke's law. So Hooke's law relates the, uh, the amount of the displacement with the amount of force from spring. And I get a feeling that yeah, it's saying amount. So I think it's uh, expecting me to give a positive answer. So what I can do is uh, this left hand side, that is my tension that I calculate as part of A. So the amount that it stretches, that's delta x. So I can say that delta x, the absolute value of it is equal to the, uh, doing the algebra in my head, the tension divided by spring constant, absolute value. 
So, so let me do that. Uh, I think I can do both of these things in the calculator. Uh, just make sure everything is in basic SI unit. Um, yeah, so weight, 13 newtons, divided by parenthesis, two times cosine of theta. Um, so 30 degrees. Um, this is just how I enter angles in my scientific calculator. Um, so that should equal uh, 7.51 newton. Let me make sure that's correct. I've made the mistakes in past the sessions before. So, <laughs> and now that I know that answer is correct, let me finish the calculation with the, by taking the tension and dividing by, and I'm checking the units as I go. Spring constant is given in Newton per meter. So when I divide it by 29 Newton per meter, I'll get the answer in meters. So this is divided by 29 Newton per meter. 0 0.25, oh, that seems a lot, uh, 25.9 centimeters. But sometimes the questions don't have uh, super, um, super um, realistic numbers. <laughs> 30 centimeters of stretch is a kind of big stretch, but whatever, it must be a pretty weak spring. So that's the, um, that's the question. And I think that this question poses challenges, especially this past week, because um, in the first week of introducing Newton's laws, we don't really um, go through standard strategy thoroughly. And uh, so this week, you will see more questions like this. The difference will be that uh, there's more support in uh, trying to teach you standard strategy. And uh, so, yeah. So that's okay. That probably took longer than it uh, needed. <laughs> but, um, so, um, so I, I'm seeing question in the chat, how to solve B, what was K? So for the K, hey, the question tells you something about the spring constant. And um, this Hooke's law is something that you are uh, supposed to read from textbook. So in the textbook, when you uh, go to university physics. And there's one section that, ha or a portion of a section that handles uh, spring force. And spring force is something that we're gonna come back to a little bit. The section 5.6, common forces, it uh, tells you about the different kinds of forces, uh, normal force, and there, we should talk about uh, spring force, tension, and um, and friction, ah, there it is, spring force. Because um, um, basically, you because the question states uh, the question this way, it says spring constant. And unless you know how we use that phrase, you won't know. And uh, here we talk about, they talk about the constant of proportionality. So, uh, so the question gives you the spring constant, but it doesn't tell you A is equal to 29 Newton per meter. That's what, why as I was going through here, I was, um, I was labeling. 